Hello and welcome back to the Coming of Cage podcast. I am one of your hosts, Derek, and I got our other host right here, Ryan. Yes, thank you for that marvelous introduction, Derek. You're welcome. You deserved it. <laughs> well, what a sweetheart. <laughs> um, we are Coming of Cage, your Nicolas Cage movie review podcast. On this episode of the show, we are discussing the 2013 movie, The Frozen Ground. Written and directed by Scott Walker, starring, of course, Nicolas Cage, as well as Vanessa Hudgens and John Cusack. This movie right. is based on a true story. Uh, as horrible as that is, I'll just do the IMDb synopsis real quick. An Alaska State Trooper partners with a young woman who escapes the clutches of a serial killer, Robert Hansen, to bring the murderer to justice. So, the big, heavy film here. Um, yeah, I would want to give a shout out to uh, Cage Match, which is another Nicolas Cage podcast that we uh, guested on. That's why we watched this one without spinning the wheel, really, because uh, we wanted to be familiar with this movie so that we could talk talk about it with them. Um, but yeah, check out their podcast as well. Yeah, so they pair two movies together. So we discussed The Frozen Ground and Pig with them uh, on their episode that is releasing, I believe, November 30th, 2023 is when that episode drops. So yeah, definitely go check that out for Cage Match there. And you can always check out our full in-depth review of Pig. That's already out. Go to comingofcage.com for that or your podcast app of choice. Ryan. You went into, you went into your VO voice there. <laughs> voice over. I, I have so voice. many. So yeah, many. it's really varied. I've seen your sizzle reel. Aww. Um <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh so yeah, we before we get into any of this, uh I'm gonna I'm gonna just gonna throw out a major trigger warning. Yes. Uh for sexual assault, um in many forms, uh torture, murder. I mean Usually we don't do trigger warnings for murder, but that is involved in this case. Um, Vi- so lots of violence, and this is based on actual events, so it's not yeah. you know. Yeah. Typical. So if that if that is something that uh, that you struggle with listening to, then definitely this is not the episode for you, and we totally understand. So go listen to one of the other episodes where that is not a thing. Um, and yeah, so the way this usually works is that while we watch the movie separately i made that sound like we watch them together but we don't usually watch them together as uh, sad as that I, makes me i take well maybe we'll do one together someday but uh yeah we i sit down and kind of take notes throughout the movie and we just kind of go chronologically through the movie i will this is just in advance i already warned derek that because <laughs> of the other podcast we recorded i had to watch this earlier than i normally would so i'm not as fresh on this movie so i'm going to be relying on derek to fill in whatever crazy scrawlings I have in here, what the actual meaning of them is. Oh boy. Sometimes he's good at deciphering that. And sometimes he's not. So we'll see what happens, but he always tries his hardest. And I, I respect that. Well, you know, I did take Ryan as a second language. <laughs> yeah. That, I think that's required in the Missouri <laughs> and Kansas <laughs> curriculums. Um, anyway. Yeah. So this movie started out with a Bible quote. That was my first note Bible quote, which for me is already an instant red flag. Going into a movie, it just reminds me of Left Behind, uh, which just was a traumatic yeah. experience. Not a great um, connection to make when you're watching a movie. Right, yeah. You know? That's not one you want to associate with yourself with in general. Um, my, yeah. my first thing that I caught was, so, you know, they do all the big production studios, get their Yeah, and there's intros. like six of them. There's a bunch of them. And one of them is Cheetah Vision. <laughs> and there's just there's a cheetah with like crosshairs and like look guys like I'm not no say on your work or anything like that but like when you're doing a really heavy material like this and you just see cheetah vision with this big cheetah and, and everything, it just I kind of giggled and I feel bad about that that was weird we commented on that too <laughs> it's not really the message you want to receive right before, or you want to send right before a uh, serious movie like this but yeah you know when you're funding these indie films you gotta get money where you, where you can get it i guess mm-hmm. uh so we start off with a police interrogation of a woman who we come to know later as cindy paulson uh who is a prostitute mm-hmm. 
Uh, we don't really know what's going on with her at this point, but we saw the police take handcuffs off her and rescue her, it seems like. Uh, so it seems like she just escaped from some really bad situation. Mm-hmm. And the police are less than helpful. Um, yeah, they're extremely dismissive. And as the movie goes on, you learn that a lot of, not all of them, but a lot of them are just dismissive of anything that happens to a sex worker, right? Correct. Which yeah. is, you know, people do that. This is based on a true story, right? They tried to get things accurate. It's just, it's a sad reality that people feel that way. Um, but, you know, if that's where our hero comes in. Yeah, our uh, sex working in this movie is very common wherever they're at. I don't remember the, the specific city, but yeah, there's like a whole area that the police know is like where all the sex workers hang out. I guess it's worth noting this movie takes place in 1983. Yeah. Right. So they're in Anchorage, Alaska, 1983, going into winter. I've never been to Alaska. I have to imagine that in the early 80s, there wasn't a whole lot to do. I have been in Alaska to Alaska, but not not in the early 80s it was a little bit after that and uh i didn't see any prostitution while i was there so you know were you looking your experiences may vary no i was (laughs) not looking on my family vacation for a prostitute (laughs) um so yeah uh one to 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 your point about them being dismissive of sex workers one of them made a really like crude joke about if if you that you can't rape a prostitute or something like that is just unnecessary. I think even in the context of the film, like there's other ways of showing that the police are dismissive of sex workers without making jokes about rape. Um, But, you know, that's the way this movie went. And we get to see our, our officer cage, which is not his name in the movie, but he is a police (laughs) officer, which is our bing on our bingo card. Um, Ding. Yeah, and I put I put next to it family man, not based on the movie. <laughs> More just the fact that he is a family man. They established that early on that you know, I don't I mean, I guess I know why they did it, but it's his wife has almost no role in the movie. She has I think two lines. Um, well, so she's there to give like this sense of urgency because they're supposed to be moving. Um, and he's retiring. Forty-eight. Um, well, he's changing careers. He's leaving yeah. the force, right, to go right. work in oil or something. And so, like, their house is being packed up, and they're supposed to be leaving. So it's, you know, I was three days away from retirement. Yeah, kinda... that was my next note. Is a co- <laughs> typical cop getting ready to retire storyline. <laughs> yeah, a little cliched, but you know, again, based on a true story. So you know, sometimes it just lines up. Yeah, yeah. So this. Uh... We, the murderer we learn is somebody that has multiple times gone to this particular strip club and said to the women that he would offer them a free photo shoot not free he's he's paying oh three hundred dollars or something like yeah, that he's paying yeah. for a photo that's shoot. right yeah um yeah it's or yeah that's how he got him because free wouldn't be yeah he's paying them to come and do a photo shoot with him um and then they get you know uh, victimized um so there it, it follows this other girl that was falling for this mm-hmm. um and for some reason she brought her dog which i thought was interesting <laughs> and then we never heard what happened to yeah, the dog i forgot about that yeah we never learn what happens yeah to the dog which in a movie where a bunch of women are raped and murdered i mean that finding out what happens to the dog is probably a lesser priority but they do well, make it a point to show the dog and like comment about the dog i could see that coming up when they're trying to find evidence and things like that you know like coming across like a clearly not wild dog or something you know right that's interesting i actually forgot all about that yeah yeah they never addressed that throughout the movie i thought that was a little weird also just who brings their dog to a paid photo shoot that seems a little weird but you know whatever um my next note is the strip, which I'm assuming is just talking about the, what they call the area that has all the prostitutes mm-hmm. hanging out. And it's a the red light district, if you will. Yeah, 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 yeah. There, it kind of reminded me of that other movie with the other Nicolas Cage movie that we watched with uh, where he had the tape. What was that where they had to investigate the tape for the smut movie or whatever? Oh, eight millimeter. Is that what that was? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, yeah that one. Uh, there was also some more places where it's just like strings of sex workers and things like that. But mm-hmm. 
It did kind of remind me of that because it's like a crowded street. There's a lot it of was, things happening on the street. Yeah, it's it was probably the busiest busy. street in the city, I imagine. Yeah, <laughs> like you I, said not a lot to do in Alaska. I, I guess that's got to be it, right? Like there just there wasn't a lot available to them. Yeah, yeah, but I didn't do a deep dive, so I don't I don't know how that all worked out. Right in real life. Um. So then we get some nudity. Which a is lot, a, which I'm not, I'm not getting like that because I'm personally excited about nudity. It's more just because there's a bingo uh, square on our bingo card for it, so sure, we have to yeah. cross that off. Yeah. Um, and then we have the bracelet. Well, so you're, so you're jumping ahead a little bit. Well, there's those two are right next to each other, so, <laughs> so I just didn't, I just didn't go into depth about the nudity. Yeah, well, no, it's all good. So there, there's one thing I want to kind of go back and talk a little bit about our antagonist in the movie here. So this is Robert Hansen is who Cindy Paulson is accusing of kidnapping her and doing all these horrible, terrible things to her. And part of the reason why the police are taking it lightly and not taking her seriously. And, you know, assuming she's lying and things like that is he of course is an upstanding respected member of the community. Right. And so, which is shocking when you get to the end of the movie, because we find out that he's been arrested like half a dozen times on other aggressive, violent charges. Right. But for some reason at this point, he has no record all of a sudden we've just, we've forgotten, you know, Oh, that Robert, that Robert, my bad. I pulled a different Robert's file. Like, you know, it just, that really threw me off that like, as the movie progresses, we learn more and more about crimes he committed and served time for, but at the beginning of the movie, it was he's never done anything wrong. Yeah. And it's not like it's a twist because from the beginning of the movie, you know that he's the guy that is doing it. You know, right. they don't make it. It's not like a mystery. They, no, they show, show. Yeah. They show him very, very quick. It's John Cusack's character. They show him extremely quick. Um, had, they, had they done the, the bread shop scene yet? Probably, point, yeah. you know, so like, I guess he owns or works in this bread shop and, you know, or, or bakery. I mean, is probably the appropriate word for sure yeah i think that's what most people would call it that's what they're called uh big breaderies um and he you know he's friendly he's personable everybody knows his name it's very cheers-esque at this point right um before obviously we get to see the real him right yeah but yeah the bracelet thing so this is the sister of one of the victims or one of the women who are missing, I guess. Right, who, Mr. Cage, Officer Cage, he's investigating all these murders, trying to put together if it's the same killer because some of the things about the murderers or, or missing persons match. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, he goes and talks to the sister of this, or the sister reaches out, I think, when they're open, reopening the file or something, something like that. In any case, the two of them get in contact with each other and they go out and have a meeting at a coffee shop or something like that. And uh, does that count as an awkward diner scene? <laughs> no, it was a coffee shop, not a diner. But okay, <laughs> we did. We, I did mention that. Um, but yeah, that's another square in our bingo for those not familiar. But we didn't get an awkward diner scene in this movie. Um, but yeah, they, so they have this little meeting, and during the meeting, the sister gives a bracelet to Officer Cage and says, "My sister had a matching one of these. She would have never taken it off." I want you to have it to, to remember what happened or something like that. And uh, so right away, me and Derek, you know, being really smart movie watchers. Big brain ex- over here. Experienced critics know that now we have a MacGuffin in this movie that's going to be the the linchpin for everything. Um, so, yeah, eh, spoiler alert, it ends up being the linchpin for everything essentially though i do Uh, think it's worth noting that that's only in the film version of these tales and that's not the big thing in reality just want to throw that out there fair enough yeah so my next note is says making this poor girl relive this shit over and over so they right at the beginning they interrogate uh cindy paulson about what happened to her and make her you know in depth describe like the rape and the torture and the uh you know being chained to a post and things like that and uh you know it's traumatic she's like crying and smoking a cigarette and everything else 
Well, then they make her relive this crap like three or four times throughout this movie and tell the same story. And every time she's emotional, as a normal human would be. And I mean, it's just crazy how much and and they don't get any new information, really, every time they do this. So it seems especially cruel. No, the only thing that really changes is the second time we learn that she had lied about her age. So in the beginning of the movie, she says she's 23. Um, and then when Nick Cage's character, uh, Jack Halcombe, when he is questioning her, I wouldn't say interrogates, he's much nicer, right, than the other cops, because um, he already believes her. Yeah. Right? He thinks she's telling the truth and he wants to catch this guy, whereas the other cops are trying to find reasons to not believe her. Um, but she does admit that she's 18. Yeah, and she was 17 when she started prostituting. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, then this is, this is the time when they start like showing video of her, what happened to her. Um, my next note is that he's keeping women chained and crying because yeah, he, it shows her like chained to a post in his log cabin Mm -hmm. and, you know, peeing on the floor because she can't go to the bathroom. So, okay. So this threw me off a little bit. I think that's supposed to be the current girl that he has. Oh, is it? Because there's like a vignette that kind of happens throughout a, the middle of the movie here where we keep cutting to him with this other girl and he eventually, spoiler alert, jumping ahead here a little bit, he eventually kills her Yeah, in the forest. And so I think that's that woman, whoever that is. Yeah. Either way, it's just giving us more context yes. as to what is happening to these women. And uh, it's it's sad and terrible. Uh, yeah, like the woman pees on the floor and then he realizes that after he steps in it and makes her clean it up. And, uh, you know, she's hurting herself trying to get out of these chains. And it's just, yeah, it's a it's a pretty brutal scene. Yeah. Um, and after that scene, they bring up that a seven that seven girls, they think, were d- taken this way uh, and that they were kidnapped for a week before they were murdered. As best mm-hmm. they can tell. Yep. Yeah. So the numbers start to climb, right? And the, the pieces kind of start fitting together that, like, this has happened many times over the years. Right. Um, and then we get more strip club nudity. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned it on the other podcast that, that we were on, Derek, but there was a lot of nudity in this movie, a more lot. so than most of the movies we've watched. I mean, I think uh, that, like, I think it might have the most out of the movies. We've it's pretty seen close so for far. sure. Yeah. Um, because like, yeah, like Zonda Lee has a lot of nudity, but it's like the same three people the entire time, aside from like one scene versus yeah. this movie. Like there are several scenes and there's like, you know, dozens of, of women. Um, yeah. There's strip club scenes. I mean, we get a lot of strip club scenes in Nicolas Cage movies with varying, you know, with varying levels of nudity. Um, but this one is, yeah, it was all hanging out there and, and there was a lot of scenes in this club. So it was a prominent place in the movie. So, Mm -hmm. um, the, around this time, the police find another body. Right. Yeah. By the shore. Throughout the movie, they find, I think three bodies or something like that, uh, that were all buried like within a mile of each other. Um, so that's where uh, they find the shell casing. Yes. The they find a shell shell casing for the 223 with the body. Mm-hmm. And uh at this point we see Cindy going on the like on the strip trying to prostitute herself again. And uh she runs into uh, another prostitute that asks her what she's doing and why she's there without a pimp, basically. Yeah, like, she's playing really young. So, like, okay, so to, to kind of clear up a couple of things, like, sh- she, you know, she'd been doing this, like, in other cities and stuff like that, but she's still kind of new to Anchorage, right? And so at this point, she's extremely distraught. She's all alone. And, yeah, this this other woman, like, takes her in, so to speak, right. to Which, get her off the know, street. It also is kind of taking advantage of her, I think, because, you know, so the, going I, just a little bit ahead, she gives her a bunch of drugs. Yeah. That she hadn't used before, so seemingly getting her, you know, uh, potentially addicted to another drug, and then uh, convinces her while she's high to strip 
for money instead of prostituting herself at this club. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I feel like that woman thought she was protecting her. Right. Like lesser of two evils kind of situation. Like don't be on the street by yourself alone. Come in here. I think it could also, it could go either way in terms of like, she could have just been manipulative, but she, or she could have been helpful. Hard, hard to say. I, I tend to agree with you that it was more like she was, you know, thinking that she was being helpful, but you know, I think in the long run that probably didn't really help much. Um, so yeah, they convince her to strip and she goes out and starts dancing and, uh, 50 cent shows up. Yeah. Yeah. His character is a little odd in this one because I'm still not entirely sure what he was trying to accomplish in this movie. Um, because in that first meeting, you're not even necessarily sure who he is or what he is to Cindy. Right. Like they could, they, be... he comes in talking like that. He knows her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he's talking in such a way where they, they could, they could be friends. They could be partners, acquaintances, you know, Co-workers. whatever. Right. And like later we learn that like, he's basically a pimp, but the way he, he the way he is handling things is very strange in each scene. Yeah. If he's a pimp, he's not a not a great one. Not very good. I at would it. say. Yeah. I mean, also yeah. there's a really, really bad hairpiece in this movie. Um <laughs> Poor but, guy. you know, it is what it is. It's yeah. you we get these movies with the rappers uh and Nick Cage. That might be a bingo card if we get any, any more of those. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. But uh yeah. So he runs in, he, he's he's mad at her because she's doing things without his representation or whatever. Um, at least that's the implication. Um, and then it, it's after this, you know, she's it shows her stripping or whatever, and then it goes to back to Robert Hansen, who's with uh, a, the girl, the other girl that he was torturing before that we saw, and he's taking her on a plane ride. So it's implied that he's some sort of a pilot or has like a pilot's license and his own small aircraft and access to this. Uh, airport to take off and and yeah i I have a big problem with this part of the story and and again like i i I try to do a little bit of research here and it was 1983 so maybe this is just the time but he was not granted a pilot's license he was denied a pilot's license for psychological reasons yet he don't find that out until later in the movie though no we don't find it out until later but he flies all the time yeah Including taking off while in a police chase, essentially. In terrible weather with a minor on board. Like, he's bringing people on these planes, right? Like, I just don't understand how... Even if they can't prove the murders, like, I feel like he should be brought up on charges for some some of that stuff. Right? But, you know, Anchorage, Alaska probably has a lot more airspace that's free to fly in, and so it's less of a big deal. I don't know. But, yeah, so he takes her on an airplane ride. And uh, he takes her, you know, he lands on a frozen lake and takes her out into the woods and essentially hunts her. Mm -hmm. Um, He, like, handcuffs her to a tree and then sets some stuff up and then takes the handcuffs off. And, of course, she runs. And, uh, you know, he pulls out a hunting rifle and shoots her and then goes up to her while she's still alive on the ground and and finishes her off with a pistol. Mm -hmm. Um, And... Then just leaves as if nothing, you know, happened. Paul Wayne lands this plane again and moves on. Um, so yeah, I had hunting people as my next note, and then I had casual racism. The N word got dropped. I don't remember who said it. It wasn't Nicholas Cage's character. Okay, yeah, I don't recall that, but okay. Um, I, I would I would guess that it was the villain, or like Robert Hansen, or. Uh, potentially one of the cops but yeah um so we get a probably the best scene in this movie i think shortly after this Hmm. where uh nick cage and uh vanessa hudgens are sitting i think at uh like an ice skating rink or something like that that's a good scene yeah and uh you know she's talking about all this stuff that she went through and at this point nick nick is trying to like you know, take care of her and protect her and keep her safe. 
and she runs away from him like six times throughout this movie and almost over dies and over again. every time. Yeah. Um, but you know, they're talking about it and she had noticed earlier in the movie that he had a picture of a woman on his desk um, and that it was his sister and she asked about it and he wouldn't answer. Um, that was during one of the early interrogations. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at this point, you know, she's going over a bunch of stuff with him and like, you know, t- explaining things about her life. And, you know, he she says something about like, why would I trust you when you can't even share a little bit of information with me about your sister or something like that? And she starts to leave. And then uh, Nicolas Cage starts explaining about his sister's death. And it was, you know, it's it, it was not like a super long scene or anything, but it was he was good in it. She was good in it. She comes to sit down when he starts talking about what happened again. And, uh, you know, it's one of the better acted scenes, I would I think, in this movie. There's a couple. John Cusack has some good scenes, too. Um, but yeah. but uh, as far as our, you know, uh, protagonists, that, I, think... I think this was probably the better scene for them. I agree. I think Cusack's given a little bit more to work with throughout the yeah, course of the true. film because he's kind of playing like two very different personalities. Whereas, you know, Vanessa Hudgens kind of has to play this this scared, lonely, victim type person for the most part throughout the whole film. And then Nick has to play the kind of the empathetic, sympathetic police detective. You know, right. um, they don't really get to break out of those roles much. Uh, Vanessa gets a couple of moments where she gets to be a little bit outside of that. But but overall, they're very kind of on the straight and narrow for what their roles are. Um, Cusack gets to play the the aloof, friendly community member and the like diabolical, horrible killer um and especially when we get to the interrogation scenes towards the end and he has to kind of walk the line between the two i mean cusack does a great job in in this agreed uh so then i realized that we had i brought this up on the other podcast so it's not a big surprise for derek but we had uh two actors from the ghostbusters universe who were acting in in the same scene together and it was probably the first time that they've been together i imagine since ghostbusters 2 came out so i thought that was interesting they weren't in the same scene in Ghostbusters 2, but um, I'm sh- they potentially met each other on set at some point. In any case, one of the actors, which was uh, when Peter Venkman it has his World of the Psychic uh, show early on in the movie, mm-hmm. um, one of the guys that's predicting the end of the world in that movie is in this scene, and then uh, a guy that works from the mayor's office that's kind of the antagonist, one of the antagonists other than Vigo in Ghostbusters 2, um, was also in the scene and they're trying to decide on giving a warrant for, I don't remember if it was a search warrant or arrest warrant or what it was. It's, it's a search warrant to, to search his home and everything. Oh, like for that. the guns and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So you're talking um, about Kurt Fuller and Kevin Dunn, I believe. Could be. Are the yeah. two you're talking about. Yeah. They, cause Nick wants all these warrants to like search the guy's house and his car and his cabin and like all this other stuff. And the judge is, is, everyone is so like walking on eggshells scared to like cross this guy. And I gotta be honest, the movie never sells that to me. Yeah. I never really was scared of the guy. He's picking on women that are, you know, that he's been torturing for a week that are, you know, probably weak and scared and, you know, everything else. And then hunting them as they run, not that fast away from him because they're malnourished at this point and everything else. You know, he's not like a particularly badass person or anything. No, but like, you know, they paint, they're trying to paint him as like this community member, but like, he's not well. Yeah, we get the one bread scene and that's about it. It's not like he's a politician. Yeah. So like, I just don't know what the risk is um, in this particular case, but you know. I don't know either. I I also found that to be a little unbelievable. Um, We also you know after that scene with the uh, trying to get the warrant nick's wife finally gets some lines <laughs> um where cuz he brings the girl back to his house to stay and uh you know to try and protect her and his wife is questioning this decision and of course the girl overhears it and leaves runs off again for i think the third time yeah and i had an, the next note was back to pimp i don't know if she went back to 50 cent at this point yeah, I believe. Or she, she does. was looking for him, maybe. 
She she's she. I'm pretty sure she takes a cab there. I'm pretty sure. And then we get a random moose scene. Oh yeah, where yeah. like she's just like walking in an alley and a moose shows up. Well, and she... it gets really close to her. It's she... like scary close. Me- moose are freaking big, man. Like really big, as big as you think they are. When in your mind, they're bigger than that in real life. I mean, they're huge. So well, part... being that close to one is terrifying. Part of that scene you were talking about, the ice skating scene, she talks about how she would like to have worked like with animal life. Yeah. And I think that was supposed to be because her. this random moose is walking up to her that now she's no, or was it like was it like the other movie where he where he was hallucinating the iguanas? <laughs> no, I'm pretty <laughs> sure she saw it, but I think this was just her opportunity to get a glimpse of what could have been. Yeah. And she goes back to the club after the moose encounter, the strip club, and uh the the villain comes in there and sees him mm-hmm. or sees her and That's she him, sees yeah. him and uh she starts like running at this point i think this is when when she starts running and uh oh or she goes to the back and they tell her to calm down i don't know my next one is bathroom drugs i'm trying to remember how we got from the from that's that to l- the bathroom drug scene yeah that's a little bit later um but <clears throat> yeah, there is there's a scene a little bit later where she's doing drugs in the bathroom at the club and um he's Hanson's like trying to find her now that he knows that she's around. And you know, so they it's a very like common movie trick in in tension scenes like this where he's looking for her and you know, we know she's you know, in the bathroom and he's opening a door that clearly looks you know, they're shooting it in such a way that's supposed to make it look like he's going where she is and you know, then it's this other guy that that finds her. She's basically OD'd, and so you know, then she's taken to the hospital. Yeah, right. Where we have to do the whole thing over again, and another uh, interrogation. Yeah, Nick's like, you gotta stay here, stay safe, yada 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 yada. Yeah. So, so then the guy, the villain Robert Hansen, goes to some random street guy that he knows and says, "Hey, I need you to find this girl." Because I guess since he's been murdering all these strippers, uh, sex workers, he's developed a relationship with some of the pimps and, like, you know, less than legal people hanging out, doing business there. And so, yeah, he goes to this guy and he's like, I need you to find this girl for me. And then he knows that 50 Cent's character is the one that, uh, like, represents her or whatever. So... He goes to 50 Cent's character and says, hey, I need this girl in two days. And then your debt will be paid. Apparently he owed some debt. They never really. Well, so this is another thing that's a little weird. So, like, it's $10,000 for this dude to find Cindy. Ten yeah. grand. And in 1983. In 1983 money. Yeah. You're right? Like... <clears throat> Where is that? Why money? is he so scared of this guy that he's willing to front all this money to get? You know what I mean? Like, it's just that thing where he's established in the community as somebody you don't want to upset, like this underworld kind of, uh, mm-hmm. you know, woman prostitute or, we, or woman pimping guy is so scared of this random dude that runs a bakery that he's willing to pay off 50 cents debt to find this girl. Well, you know I think, I, mean? I think it's because. Hansen's paying that same amount. He's basically saying, like, 50 Cent owes him 10 grand. Cusack's going to give him 10 grand. So as long as 50 Cent can just give me this girl, we'll consider it even. But then he makes no money. I don't know. It's a weird, it, either way. It, well, it was... I think in his mind, he gets the money back. Whereas right now, 50 Cent's not going to pay it, right? He's not sure. getting it. He, right now, he's not getting his money back. And so he sees this as like the one way to get his money back. Yeah, so he tells he tells Fifty Cent, "Get me the girl in two days or whatever." And so he's trying to get her the girl, or get him, get the get him the girl. Um, I think this is the point where they finally get the warrant mm-hmm. and start searching his house, and uh, they don't find anything for a long time. Like they spend a day, a full day, basically going through everything and not finding any. They found guns, but none of the guns are. Uh, chambered in 223. Well, so I guess one bit we kind of skipped a little bit ago was um, 
they are staking out his house at one point and he yeah. catches on to that. And so he takes that's a bunch when, of stuff. That's when he goes in the plane in the storm. In the storm with his son. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he stashes a bunch of stuff out in, in the forest after after flying for a while. Yeah. And so the cops, Nick in particular, they're all worried that the dude dumped his dumped all of the evidence. Right. So and that they'll never find it. Right. Um yeah. So they get a warrant and they're doing all that. Uh and at the time they arrest him around this time too and bring him in for interrogation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, we get some really good scenes of him being interrogated. Um where he's like you said playing two sides of a coin essentially uh a guy that paid or that served his time for his crimes and you know it's just a guy that had bad circumstances or whatever and he plays it up really well well and... so before the interrogation there is the end of 50 cent oh yeah he's killed so so, so i want to ask you a question about this scene Okay, so Fiddy gets Cindy. Cindy thinks that you know they're gonna go and leave Anchorage together, right? So for some, she to some level she trusts him enough to go with him, right? And he then meets up with the dude that Cusack paid off. Yeah. Okay. And it's in the middle of nowhere. It's snowing. She's freaking out, of course, right? And then Fiddy sent pulls a gun on this dude. Yeah. So what do you think? he was trying to accomplish he gets killed so it didn't work but what do you think his goal was i you know part of me thinks that maybe he was trying to protect his girl and then the other part of me thinks that maybe he's just going to take the money that that the guy had i don't know he just assumed the guy had the ten thousand dollars or whatever on him i don't think he knew about the money i don't know well he knew that there was that his debt was being paid somehow and i it wasn't just by service i mean I don't know. It, it's it's a really weird scene, but yeah, he gets clapped pretty quickly, and uh, and then the, there's a chase, and that mm-hmm. isn't that the, the the interrogation is happening before this. By the way, you you kind of jumped ahead because is I know this says pimp murder shortly after the interrogate interrogating murderer. It doesn't matter. But how is she there then? Well, the... she gets she gets there later as the interrogation is still going on. They're interrogating him for a while. Without Nick Nick Cage because he has to yes. leave. Okay. Well, I guess I didn't realize that. Okay. Okay. I got you now. Um, yeah, because then the motel confrontation happens. Right. Um, between people. <laughs> well, <laughs> I yeah. don't remember much of this. Nick, Nick, so Nick's been working on and off with this guy uh, who's in another branch of. I forget, oh, that's right. I forget exactly. Vice. He's maybe. been helping him. Yeah, he's yeah. been helping him. Like deal with the streets of this guy like knows he knows like what the strip is like and he knows who's who and things like that and so he's helping like find cindy and then they have to confront the dude who's trying to to basically take her away um but but they get her and then we have like the really big climactic interrogation stuff right you know and they they found a map and the map's got all these places marked and where they found two of them or where they found bodies or something like that well because hansen keeps why i hunt there this is where i hunt that's where i hunt like well this is where this body was found this is where this body was found there's like 20 something 24 i think marks on the map right right and you know cusack's like like we found the gun we know it's gonna match you know your the the shell that we found and Um, then yeah nick gets the brilliant idea to bluff with the uh bracelet well, because the guy's not cracking. He's not right. he's not confessing. They need him to confess. Yeah. And at this point, he has a lawyer there. He does. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Nick, so Nick busts in with the bracelet that he was given, which is not the bracelet from the victim, which you see that he dumped. Right. It was in that pile of stuff he grabbed when he ran to the plane. And uh, but he he goes in with the bracelet that he has and he uses that to convince um the murderer that you know, they found all the evidence and then he's, he starts just spilling the beans. Like the trope, you know, happens. <laughs> they've, they figured out one piece of his plan. So he figures he might as well just spill everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah. well, the, they, then they open a door and there's Cindy. Yeah. Staring at and him. He, he, and she, it's, he it's very, a few good out. men, you know, you can't handle the truth. He's like, I should have killed you when I had the chance. And right. You know, it all falls apart at that point. Yeah, and that's basically where the movie ends. 
Um, some key key things to be aware in real life. That's not how he confessed. He he confessed after they matched the gun to the shell. Um, he confessed to seven murders because apparently confessing to more than that would have been a, a much more ridiculous sentence. He ended up confessing to more later. Um, and uh, it could... <coughs> 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 Sorry. Okay. He ended up con- confessing to more later, and it could have been like, it's possible it was as many as 30 people over the yeah. years. We'll never really know. The thing that kind of left my bad my bad taste in my mouth at the end of this movie is that after the movie is essentially over, they start showing pictures of all the women and their, you know, the information about them, whether the body was found and things like that. But it, it, that makes it seem like this is a, you know, selfless thing where they're trying to raise awareness for, you know, this these crimes that happen. But in reality, this is a for-profit movie that a studio made. And probably didn't donate a bunch of money to the victims' families or anything like that. Um, so I, I always hate that when it's kind of acting like this is a you know something that they were doing to give exposure to the families. When in reality, they the studio I'm sure made some money. Well, so as it turns out, the studio didn't really make any money off of this film. Well, because, that they wanted to. Well, so so here's here's what's interesting. The movie was originally planned to have a full, wide 2000 theater release, like a normal film. Yeah. But right before it was going to come out, um, Lionsgate purchased Summit Entertainment, which th- was making this movie. And then they thought they had too many films on their slate. So it had a really limited run and was released to vod um at the same time as its very limited theater run so the whole movie like it made next to nothing it made like five million dollars or something like that uh which was a big loss uh because it needed to make like 30 35 million just to break even yeah um but, well the intent was to yeah. make money with oh, it, totally even though that wasn't how it worked out due to a bunch of corporate stuff but 100 percent um now cindy paulson like she actually assisted um with the story uh and, and having this made she allowed herself to be interviewed by them for many 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 hours um covering a lot of things that she never really talked about in any other interviews or anything else like that <clears throat> um so she at least was on board for whatever reason um she was on set at times as well um and I'm guessing the reason was money i mean uh, i don't know it, it doesn't say you know, I assume she wasn't doing it for free. I'm, I'm sure she was compensated in some way. How much, I, I can't say. Um, it may have been just... Well, it didn't look like a $30 million movie, so... No. No, it was like a $15 million movie. Um, it didn't look like a $15 million movie either. Well, let's let's check, shall we? I can look I believe while, you. I'm just saying, talking, like, but... the, the cast was probably most of that money. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'm sure she got quite a bit as well. I don't know about that. I really don't. Um, yeah, we don't have numbers for that, but I'm just guessing. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The budget was $27 million. Yeah, where did all that go? So, I don't know. Um, I mean, they, they only shot for like 26 days. Um, and they shot in, in Alaska on site, and they shot in the fall going into the winter because uh, Scott Walker wanted it to really feel like it would have at that time of year. Um so maybe it was. It sounded like you said Skywalker wanted that to. Yeah, to Luke. Luke Skywalker. Um... I had to second guess what. <laughs> why was Why was Skywalker there? Yeah, Luke. Anyway. Luke thought this was very important after his days training Jedi. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, but that's. I mean, yeah, that's how the movie ends. I did feel like the music in the credit sequence when they're showing all the women was a little odd for what it was we were looking weird. at. That whole um, sequence was kind of weird. But that's the movie, man. It's it's, it's heavy. It's dark. Yeah. Um, now we got to rate it. Yeah, we do. We do. So we have our Kjo meter. Uh, we rate movies uh, zero through twenty, zero low, twenty high. We do this on overall quality and overall caginess. And um, 
you know, let's let's get going on that. Do you want to do you want to go first? Or you want me to go first? And I can go first. You can go first. Uh, it, right. it, can you answer a question for me real quickly? I certainly can. What did I rate Bad Lieutenant Port of Call New Orleans? An eight. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to give this a seven because I think it was slightly worse than Bad Lieutenant Port of Call New Orleans. Really? Yeah. Actually, IMDb gr- agrees with me. I was just noticing that. Actually, yeah, they do. It's a 6.6 on IMDb, whereas Bad Lieutenant... Or 6.4, I bad Lieutenant Porta Call is 6.6. So Yeah. Um but you know they're on a 10 point scale, so that means we're real low <laughs> compared to that. I mean, that's true. We didn't like either of those movies as much as they did. Um, I actually thought this was better okay. than Bad Fair Lieutenant. Enough. Um, I thought that uh Nick, Vanessa Hudgens, and John Cusack both provided good performances uh, particularly Cusack in this pulled off a, a really good performance I mean he plays he plays a very good bad guy in this movie um and so I, was, I think exhibit was better than 50 cent so uh, that's true that's certainly <laughs> true that is true um I but I, yeah I also gave bad lieutenant an eight I definitely preferred this movie I'm actually gonna give this movie a 10. wow we're way off on this one yeah yeah, this is this one's a little different for us. That gives it an eight and a half overall on quality. Now we've got caginess. There's like no real caginess in this movie. He gets a little heated in the interrogation scene, but other than that, he's pretty calm, collected. Yeah. He's sympathetic and empathetic. He's caring. He's very mellow through most of this. And when he does get heated, it's all very legitimate. It's all very reasonable. Um, so I'm I'm gonna give it like a two on caginess. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I don't think it's yeah. There's almost nothing. I mean, if you're watching a movie, this movie, hoping to see a little cage freak out, you're not going to. Yeah, exactly. So there you go. So an eight and a half on quality and a two on caginess. So normally at this point we would go ahead and add a movie to our wheel o cage, but because this was a special episode that we did outside of our normal wheel, we don't actually have to do that this week. So next time, next week we're going to have a brand new wheel of cage. Just going to pick a brand new movie based on what happened from Snowden, our Snowden episode, not this episode. So. That's not happening this time, all right? Uh, But go to comingofcage.com for all of our links to our stuff. You can, of course, subscribe on your podcast app of choice. You can watch us on YouTube. And we've got our Wheel of Cage, and we have our Cajo Bingo series where we play bingo. If if you do listen to us on something like Spotify, you know, give us a rating. We'd appreciate that. Yes. And if you drop us a review somewhere, like a written review, please let us know. We will read it on the show. That's right. So Derek will do his best Nicholas Cage impression while he's reading it. It's going to be can, glorious. He's working on it. it. It's it's yeah, he's he's test running it right now. Oh boy. Pressure. Uh, it's not ready for prime time yet, but has the pressure. We're getting there. All right. Well, I think that's it for us. This has been the Coming of Cage podcast. I'm Derek, that's Ryan. See ya hopefully not in Alaska. <laughs> <laughs>